Hello and welcome to A Gentleman Talks, our series of one-to-one -one interviews with ladies and gentlemen about their life, their influences and their experiences, all within our framework of making the world a more respectful, stylish and gentlemanly place here at The Perfect Gentleman. And I am delighted, honoured and a little nervous, I have to say, today to be speaking to Ridian Llewellyn. Hello Ridian, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Zach. Um, so, uh, I will tell you about what, why I'm nervous later, but um, really for the audience out there, would you please just tell us who you are and what you currently do? Right, I'm a retired headmaster um, and I currently uh, still work in the independent educational world, um, introducing clients to our leading schools, um, governing schools, helping um, governing bodies select headmasters and headmistresses and appraising heads. Fantastic. Now the reason I'm nervous is because you used to teach me yes. at school <laughs> many moons ago yes. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always honoured to speak to you because it's a great, uh, uh, great honour and mm. um, uh, I remember fondly my time at Arnold House where I, you taught and, yes. and you're one of my favourite teachers I have oh, to say. Thank you. But um, this is not about me, it's about <laughs> you. So I, I get to reverse the tables a little bit. Yes. So um, uh, I start these things, uh, as I always do, mm. uh, at the very beginning. Mm. So, Ridian, where were you born and raised, and what mm. was your earliest influences in life? I was born in uh, St Mary's Paddington of Welsh parents. Uh, so I was raised in the Vale of De Morgan. My father was a uh, Member of Parliament for Cardiff North. And when he gave up his seat, we went to live in Berkshire. So a lot of people who say to me, well, you don't sound very Welsh, although you've got a very Welsh sounding name, it was because we moved to England abroad. Uh, we moved to England in 1963. Um, my greatest influence growing up was undoubtedly that of my father. Um, and he was just, he had this rather Welsh romantic uh, notion that uh, he wanted a son of his to be a schoolmaster, and um, uh, and he was ju he lived just long enough to see me become a headmaster. So I'm pleased about that. That's very excellent. Um, where did you go to school? I went to prep school at Heatherdown in Ascot, um, and actually went back to teach there during my gap year, and then I went to Pangbourne College, which was. Very close to us, in, we lived in a village called Yattenden, my mother still does. Um, and uh, although it, you know, I, was, I, had, I was a boarder, of course, uh, but it was, it, the school was only five miles or so from where we lived. And then when I left school, um, I said to my father rather nervously, um, Dad, I think I'd like a gap year. Well, gap years in 1975 weren't de rigueur as they are now. And I thought he'd explode. Um, however, he didn't. He said, well, that's absolutely fine by me, but how are you going to support yourself? Oh, that hadn't really occurred to me. Uh, so uh, I thought, well, what could I do? And I said, well, I'm quite fancy going back to my prep school, Heather Dunn, to teach for a year. And that's how I got started as a schoolmaster. OK. Is it, so it was sort of more by default than Judgment. Yes, it, it, it was more by default, actually. A and several times later, I mean, I, then I went up to university here in London and uh, tried to do other things. Uh, and somehow, partly I think my, definitely my father's influence, he'd bombard me with uh, advertisements for, I, mean, I had a, by that stage I had a little flat at the top of Primrose Hill, Eaton Avenue, and uh, he, he saw an advertisement in the Guardian, of all places, uh, for a teacher of Latin and French at your prep school, Arnold House. And uh, it really wasn't a very suitable job for me. I, mean, I did have an O-level in Latin, uh, and I had an A-level in French, but that, that wasn't exactly qualifications, I didn't think. Um, and then I went for my interview with, I know, the headmaster for whom you have and, and so, so did I, who became a mentor, my, my mentor really, Johnny Clegg at Arnold House, and he was the one who said, I was rather, as most 
you know, early 20 year olds, rather irresponsible and young and not really knowing what I wanted to do. And he said, you've got to become um, prep school headmaster. And that's how it all started. We're going to talk a little, uh, quite a bit about, <coughs> a little bit about Old House, certainly mm. a lot about Mr. Clegg mm. and that kind of influence on you. Mm. Um, but let's go back two steps. Yes. So w w uh, you went to university, you did your gap year, you in and you enjoyed it? I did my gap year and I loved it actually. And I was very lucky. Um, I, I, it, it was, Heather Down was, I think it's fair to say, uh, a rather old fashioned uh, school, but, but none the worse for that. With some very interesting boys. I mean, I taught Prince Edward, um, having been Prince Andrew's dormitory captain while I was there as a boy. Um, and of course, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, and his elder brother, Alexander. So I was very lucky, really. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I, I took David and some of his friends to America. I was his tutor in about 1976, 77, um, during wow. one summer holidays. So um, uh, I was in the right place at the right time, I think. How was, how, was, how was going to America in that point in time? It was, it was, it was extraordinary, because I'd been brought up in really rather <coughs> old-fashioned way with, I'd never, I mean, I, I was too, my sister and brother were much older than I was, and they, they were allowed to go on family holidays to smart places like La uh, I had to go to Bognor with my nanny. <laughs> and, uh, and so the first time I had flown was in Concord um, in 1977, I think. Uh, in those days, it just flew to, to Washington with a young David Cameron and five of his friends. And I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> this 18, 19 year old who should have been in charge of, vaguely in charge of his party. I mean, I, <laughs> 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 I, uh, uh, there was a, a very pretty French nanny, if I remember, called Nicole de Padois. And uh, we had a great time. Yeah. Did, did you were in Washington most of the time? No, we went all over the place Washington, New York. Um, Florida, of course, we had to go to both Disney World and Disneyland, um, uh, Grand Canyon. Um, wow. I ended up in a week, week in San Francisco. It was the most amazing trip because, of course, one of David's friends was a, was a Getty. Right. So that, that explains, that explains I think, the style <laughs> uh, in which it was done. But it was quite something for me, let alone these 10, 11 year old boys. Oh, I bet. I'm Especially not... America at that time is a very different America than it was Absolutely. now. And, and, and Absolutely. No, it was great fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a great experience, especially mm. for a gap year. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I, I, I suppose um, if it hadn't been for my father, none of it would have happened. So you went to university. You went to university in London. I did, University College London, yes. And what did you, what did you read? What did you I study? read history. Um, I, I, I tried in my... Seventh term, school, seventh term Oxbridge in those days, I tried to read um, uh, English at Emmanuel Cambridge, but they didn't want me. Um, and so I thought, well, I, English and history, I love both subjects at school. And I um, decided to have a, a go at reading history, which I, which I greatly enjoyed. And, uh, but, but still, as with a lot of people, found myself you know, with a degree uh, but not knowing what to do with it. And uh, so it was then, I think, that my father stepped in. And, and kept uh, handing you. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and that's how it happened, yeah. So uh, Old House is where I went to school yes. and where you went to, uh, to teach. Yes. Uh, and as you mentioned, Mr. Uh, Jonathan Clegg was yes. the headmaster at the time. Yes. Yes. And uh, I remember him mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. very a formidable man. Yes. He was quite a, uh, a large man. Yes. Both height and girth. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a very imposing figure. He always, mm -hmm. he always went, when he strode through the school corridors, you knew it. Yes. Um, yes. But he had an amazing soft and gentle side. Yes. Um, yes. And I have to say, my schooling years, and I've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about them previously and other times, were not after that. I think that, the, that what was that, what was sad for me was that was the pinnacle of my school educational edu apogee. Yeah. yeah, because I had a fantastic mm. time there. I, mm. I mean, I was a very sick kid, so mm. it was a, it's a mm. difficult time for me. But but that was fantastic. I, after mm. that, school never held the kind of joy and enthusiasm and fun mm. that it was. Mm. How was it for you? Mm. Uh, how was it for you being there? How was it for you teaching? And 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 what was sort it, of that like, experience like? It was great fun. And I think that the reason 
that you had fun, despite, despite not always enjoying the best of health. I think the reason you had fun was because we had fun. And I do think that if you're, the adults in your life um, have a smile on their face rather than a frown, it, it, is, it is likely to, to, to rub off. Um, I, I, I remember my interview with Johnny Clegg. Um, even my interview was fun. Um, he, he, he was advertising, as I've just said, for a teacher of, English, uh, of, of Latin and French. And I was completely unsuitable. But what I discovered he really wanted was someone to take the football and the cricket. And of course, he was a, he was a legendary footballer. He had had trials for Man U. He was a schoolboy at Shrewsbury School and very well known for running down the wing incredibly quickly. I mean, you find that hard to imagine when, uh, by the time he came into your life. Uh, but wearing, he always wore plimsolls, not football boots, so he'd run faster. And uh, he had a trial for Man U. He was offered professional terms by Wolves. So he was a tremendous footballer. He was a very good all-round games player at Oxford, a member of Vincent's club, etc., etc. Um, a very uh, accomplished games player, and he really wanted someone to run the cricket and the football. Now, I could tick one box. Um, flannel fool, I could, I could answer to, but, but I, I'm, not a cons I'm not a great shiny shorts man. <laughs> and um, and uh, he asked me about football. And he didn't ask me one question about Latin or French, fortunately. <laughs> He asked me about football, and I said, well, I watched Match of the Day. Of course, I had no idea he'd been such a great footballer <laughs> himself. But then the key part of the interview was in the playground, and strategically placed was a bat and a ball. And I, I'm sure you remember how he spoke in a rather clipped way. And he said, right. And he got out of the playground, he said, right, you bet, and I'll bowl. And that was my interview. And, oh, of course, you could see that I was a cricketer of sorts. I'd been captain of cricket at school. And I played a bit of Hampstead in the leagues. And uh, he said, right, OK. And uh, we went to, in those days, there was an Italian pub called the Rossetti in St John's Wood. There do you was. That? I do. I, we used to go there all the time as a family for dinner. And it was a fantastic restaurant. It was pub. And uh, we went there and we had, I can't remember what we had to eat, but I certainly we had the first of many. Uh, gin and French. <laughs> and uh, that was my interview. And, uh, uh, and eventually I had a letter in his, in his very, very terrible handwriting, which he I could barely bad, decipher. Appalling. And I started at uh, Arnold House. But he was, you're right, I mean, he, 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 would, he was a very kindly man. And he, he took, I was lucky. I got on well with him. Uh, I was a bit wild. I used to put, I, I was bit of a racing man, so I used to put on the staff bets. And uh, it was a more relaxed time. There were no inspections or, yeah. um, you know, everything that um, uh, we have to put up with today. Um, and so it was the last of a golden period, really, in which uh, teachers could get on with teaching. And, uh, and actually, we were encouraged by Johnny to be both good teachers, i.e. relate well to one's subject, but even more important, I think, in his book, to be good schoolmasters, i.e. relate well to the children. And uh, he, he got a formidable team of um, schoolmasters and schoolmistresses around him and ran a very happy ship. But he had the great quality that all good heads must have, a subtext, don't mess with me. <laughs> and he had that. Oh, yeah, in spades. Mm. <laughs> he, he definitely had that in spades. Yeah. I remember that very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fear of going up to the stairs to yes. his office yes. if you've been bad. Yes. was yes. always the, the, the one thing that kept most of the school in line, I yes. think. Yes. Um, but uh, um, I, I remember very fondly the whole period of time, mm. and in fact, wearing the, the 42 Club, the, the, noticed, the old yes. school tie, as yes. you noticed when yes. I came in. Because um, I'm, mean, again, very proud. Um, it, so, I mean, he was a fantastic man. How was your experience apart from, you know, you sort of, that was your first job. Yes. It was your first yes. experience. First proper job. Yeah. First proper yeah. job. First sort of experience yeah. in a school like that. Mm. Did you sort of take to it willingly? And, and then I did. I was very lucky. I, there was some wonderful, uh, you, you'll remember Jill Stern and one, one or two others, um, 
you know, so, who, who sort of mothered me. And, uh, and we, they, we had a great time. Um, uh, I, I, I liked the collegiate life um, and uh, I was there for four years. And um, they were four very happy, happy ones. I mean, you touched on something which I, I, I want to talk about a little bit later, mm. which is about the schoolmasters and teachers, because mm. I, I think mm. there's a big difference there. Um, mm. But let's move on from Old House. Yeah. What happened after Arnold House? What, 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 what sort of, you, you said you were there four years, what, what was next? Well, next came, um, after a small interlude, next came the Dragon School in Oxford. And, and um, Johnny had been at Brasenose with uh, Keith Ingram, the headmaster of the Dragon School. And um, I remember Johnny saying to me one day, up at a party at Bridal Gardens where he lived, he said, uh, I think you should go to the Dragon School. Which, he said, in my humble opinion, is the finest preparatory school in the world. And, um, and after a while, I, I went off to the Dragon School. And, um, and Keith Ingram, like, they were very similar, like Johnny. They were, they were like each other in many ways, capable of gruffness. But the gruffness was, the gruffness masked a very kindly man, and uh, who is, again, just as Johnny is loved by you and generations of boys at Arnold House, so was Keith Ingram, or Inky as he was known, um, was loved by the boys, and girls, of course, Dragon. And uh, I was very lucky, really, when, when, after a year or so, I was offered the, 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 a big job, to be housemaster of schoolhouse. Uh, I was only, I think, 29 or so. so I was, quite young, and, and, and the first married uh, uh, housemaster of schoolhouse that in bachelors before that. So it was quite a big change. And we looked after 80, 11 to 13 year old boys. So did many of the things that a headmaster of a smaller school would do. And um, so um, when it came to um, Papawick uh, Prep School opposite number seven car park, Ascot races, and race schools, became available, I was lucky enough to get the job. Um, so that, that put me in very good sense. So I was, I was at Arnold House for four years and the Dragon School for five years, and then 12 years as headmaster of Papua. So that's how it all came about, and I, I, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. You talked about um, Jonathan being, Mr. Clegg being a men mentor of yours. Yes. And was Keith Ingram yes, as well. Yes, definitely. How were they mentors to you? What, what was they? What, what was it that that what? I mean, uh, you you yes. never say that you were, but to their face, obviously. But, no. but how how, would, how did that relationship develop? It, and and yes, it it wasn't so much what they said. I mean, they that I don't remember either of them saying, "Well done," too often. <laughs> Except actually, Johnny, he liked to win his uh, football and cricket matches. Um, yeah, uh, he did. Uh, but but there wasn't there wasn't a lot of praise. It was more subtle than that. Um, I, I remember with Keith Ingram, um, after I'd been a housemaster for three weeks, um, I was shutting up the house at night and I was fortunate again in that he still lived. It was his last year or so before retirement. And he lived in the same house as I did. And I remember locking up the house one evening um, and Keith was in his study and uh, he again, he too had a very distinctive voice and he could silence a room by clearing his throat famously ah! absolute silence you know quite an art um, and um, he said I think the housemaster needs a bit of propping up and that meant a wonderful array of malt whiskies and I remember his favorite was um, and Morangi, I think, but I was rather keener on Lafray, you know, a nice woody one. And uh, so he, 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 propping up, meant having a glass or two with him and listening to, uh, you know, a few stories, you know, classic ell elliptical stories which told more than they said. And then he said, I want you to go up to old Buckingham Hall, the prep school up in Suffolk. Um, a friend of mine, Donald Sewell, has been headmaster for many, many years, and he's retiring. 
And I thought, well, I've been in this job for three weeks. He's trying to palm me off up to Suffolk, where I don't want to go. And um, I said, Keith, are you trying to tell me something? And he said, uh, he said, no, 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 no. But you must always get it. Was it somehow assumed that I was going to become a headmaster? It was never said, never stated. And uh, he said, no, 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 you must always go for a job uh, when you go for an interview when you don't want the job. So I went up there, and I, and um, and of course, when it came to the question, would you accept this job if it was offered to you? I said, well, actually no. But <laughs> 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 but but he was right. It gave you, you know, when it didn't matter. So you get, you had an interview under your belt, and so when it came to Papawick a few few years later, I'm sure that's still been good said. So there was nothing. You know, they didn't, that generation didn't heap praise on you or uh, make it that obvious that they rated you. It was just in those small things. And, and Johnny particularly was very adept at getting you to fess up to the mistakes you'd made rather than him telling you. Um, and, uh, you know, so that you would go to him and say, look, I'm sorry, uh, I... I done this just just in case there's any feedback I can't think of a specific example but they were very good like that and I remember one night at the, at the dragon we had a party at the end of a summer term and the, it got later and later and later and it was far too late for the boys to go to bed I mean there were 12 13 year old boys it was practically midnight <coughs> and I could see Keith uh, looking out of his uh, win window and I and so I thought well the best thing to do is to say to him tomorrow I'm sorry we were so late last night things that you know uh, and you know, they had an aura about them that you simply did not want to let them down. And I think that was um, something very special. Very, very special. Mm -hmm. I think it's somewhat lacking a little bit now. Uh, definitely. Somewhat lacking. Uh, yeah. So you, you fulfilled, A, your father's dream, yeah. and Mr. Clegg, and Mr. Ingram's, <laughs> of becoming a, a, a headmaster. Yes, yes. How was that? It was... A wonderful experience which I, uh, has enabled me to do what I do now and given me freedoms that I would, wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have enjoyed. Of course, being a headmaster, the, I mean, as a housemaster at the Dragon School, I can honestly say I cannot remember a disagreement with any of the parents of boys in the house, many of whom became our great friends. They understood instinctively what we were trying to do, um, you know, the schoolmaster bit, if you like, and prepare them for, for, for the next stage. Um, of course, the buck didn't stop with me. It stopped with Keith Ingram and, of course, his successors as headmaster. So I think that I, the first thing I learned as a headmaster is that <laughs> the buck stopped with me um, and that it simply... You know, I suppose there'd been a sort of an element of, sort of, sort of, uh, of thinking that this job was really terribly easy. Um, and uh, as a headmaster, one is disabused of that. And, and inevitably, you are not going to. I, I was a boarding school man, for example. I, I, I believed in the whole ethos of boarding. Um, I mean, not the sort of parents at arm's length boarding of my youth, but the boarding as it evolved during the 80s and 90s lots of parental access, the best of both worlds, you could say, the sort of permanent sleepover with your mates, and yet not feeling that you were away from mum and dad, <coughs> been sent away to school in those emotive terms. Um, but at Papawick, we, 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 we were a boarding school um, that was very happy to take um, day children to begin with, but we did make them board at the age of 11. And there were very good reasons for that. It was something that I inherited and was determined to hang on to. Because, um, after all, all our boys went on to, you know, the Eatons, the Harrows, the Wellingtons. They were all boarding schools. Where, where you know, for, from Papplewick, where do you go to day school? There, weren't, there was not that much choice. I suppose one or two went to Hampton. Even fewer went to the Royal Grammar School at Guildford, but but they were principally we were a school that prepared boys for um, the traditional boarding schools. And how much easier it is to board for the first time at eleven, when you're a relatively big boy in a little school where you've already got your mates, rather than 
bored for the first time at 13 in a new school in which you were learning to rub shoulders with fellow pupils who are grown men. So, and, and there were a number of parents, of course, who, who fought us all the way on this. And uh, one or two who said, right, if you insist that my son comes into board at, at 11, um, we, we'll take him away. And, and you just have to, you, in those circumstances, you realize, or I realized for the first time, that um, you know, you're not going to be universally loved. Uh, you've got to do what you believe to be right. Um, and um, uh, more times than not, I'm sure we were successful in persuading them. Well, boys were never the problem, really. Uh, <laughs> Always the damn parents. <laughs> um, they were more than happy, I think, to come into board. Um, and uh, it was always a very parent-friendly school, and there were matches on Wednesdays and Saturdays, the Sunday service, uh, you know, and exits and half terms, and lots of parental contact. And I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Um, but you know, I, used to, I remember saying to a parent, "Well, you're not going to go into Eric Anderson's uh, office at Eton and demand that your son is a day boy." Uh, and so, don't do it here. You know what we are. We are a boarding school from the age of 11. And of course, many of them boarded before that. Mm. What was your biggest achievement at paperwork, did you, uh, would you say? Um, what are you most proud of? Gosh, what am I most proud of? I'm not most, I can tell you what I'm not most proud of, um, the buildings. We, we did, we put up two spectacular buildings that had a very, very successful appeal and built a sports hall and a music school, which are still pretty much uh, unrivaled in the, in, in the prep school world. And of course I was proud of that, but I think if one gets too carried away by buildings, I, I think my greatest achievement was in getting around me a really good staff. Just as, just as I'd learned from, from Johnny at Arnold House, from Keith Ingram at The Dragon, a really good staff, now seven of whom have since gone on to be heads themselves. Now, I think Thanks. that is the thing of which I'm most proud. Yeah. My spine is tingling. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's really good. Um, so you left Papelwick? Papelwick. I left Papelwick in uh, 2003. Why? I had done 12 years. I toyed with the idea of going on to another school. I think I was very conscious of the fact that um, I was no longer making the educational weather. Right. I think I'd started, age 32, as something of a young liberal from the Dragon School with its notorious deep litter free range system, come to a much more traditional prep <coughs> school, uh, who's, which, which suited me actually you know, per perfectly well. Um, and I was no longer making the educational weather. You can respond pretty skillfully to its storms. I think I'd become desensitized to some of the parents' um, needs. I had turned from a young liberal into a complete reactionary. And, and I think that's the time to go. If you're no longer enjoying it as you once did, um, the boys, uh, uh, as I said, <coughs> were always the easy bit. And the staff, I, 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 I got on extremely well with the vast majority of the staff. And, um, but it was a combination of two things. One is, is, is as, as I've just e explained. Second, um, I, I had just been diagnosed uh, as uh, uh, having late onset type one diabetes. And I'd lost a huge amount of weight w whilst drinking and eating perfectly normally. So I think that it was a combination of actually failing to control my blood sugar levels at, at a time when I, I, I was no longer enjoying it as much as I should. And it comes back to the point that I made earlier, that, I, that, that you were happy at Arnold House because I think we as a staff were happy. And I think if you have a headmaster who is slightly um, uh, world-weary. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it was George Littleton, a famous Eton housemaster, who said that the only essential quality in a schoolmaster is invincible optimism. And I was no longer 
I certainly wasn't invincible, and I certainly was no longer all that optimistic. <laughs> and I thought that, I genuinely thought at the time, that a golden age had passed, and that we, the independent schools were suffering from a, a creeping nationalisation. Um, yeah. And um, so, um, uh, the, those were the reasons really, and, and uh, there are practical considerations as well. Um, I, I could take early retirement on uh, grounds of ill health, so a very generous teacher pension scheme, which isn't quite what it um, is <coughs> today, but it was very, very, very nice then. Um, and uh, I'd just been given a, a house to live in. I mean, a lot of schoolmasters, just you know, particularly in the boarding school world, go through a sort of rather charmed existence in which they don't have to worry about a roof over their head. They're, okay, you're not paid a king's ransom, but you get all your bills paid for you. Um, and, and the real world, um, you know, comes as a bit of a shock. Um, but I, I, my aunt had had a stroke, sadly. And uh, although she lived another 10 years, and I looked after her during those 10 years, she moved into a nursing home, and we moved into her house. Okay. So that's how it happened. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you, uh, you had a happy time at Paperweight. Yeah, very much. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's still a wonderful school. I went back the other day to, we, we took our boys on a, I think the first prep school, and I'm not sure not the only prep school to have taken a rugby tour to New Zealand. Not a place you go to with a weak side. No. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and we had a 20-year reunion uh, of that touring side with, with the boys and their parents. Oh, and uh, so I went back and I was asked very kindly by the headmaster um, to, to, to speak. And um, that was... I, but I'm not a bore. Uh, I don't think you should go back, really. Uh, I think it's... it's, it's um, you know, I only go back when I absolutely have to, uh, sadly, a, a, a funeral or memorial service or... But, but plenty of old boys and parents keep in touch with me and that's... So I'm very happy about that. Did you have a nickname? Well, that's a good question because nicknames were de rigueur, the dragon, very much so. I'm not sure. I'm not, I honestly, I'm not sure. I don't think. I don't think I did. I think that they might ref boys might refer to me by my first name uh, occasionally or uh, abbreviation abbreviated form Rid. Um, you know, I heard them talking about the old man, which I thought, God, I'm no, young, I, I'm no younger than the young headmaster. I'm some old fogey now. Um, I don't think so, Zach. I don't think so. Did I at Arnold House? No, no, no I don't, no, I don't no, think no, I did. No, no, no. One well, of the few teachers wasn't, that I, didn't. I wasn't a big enough character, perhaps. No, I think you were, you were too nice to have them. The, 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 the <laughs> nicknames are generally for age you're terrified of or, or don't like very much. I think, I, I think that was the... There were a few, but no, no. Uh, um, no, not that I recall. <laughs> no, I remember Richard Curtis coming to, um, he's an old boy of uh, mm -hmm. Papawick, won top scholarship from Papawick to uh, Harrow in 1969. And I remember he came to give, give away the prizes one um, uh, speech day. And he said during the course of his uh, wonderfully witty uh, talk, he said, um, people uh, ask, often ask me how I... Um, came up with a character like Mr. Bean. <laughs> and, and he said, and actually, it was quite simple. All I had to do was to remember some of the people who taught me at Papawick and tone them down a bit. <laughs> like, oh, dear. <laughs> people flicking through mm, all, mm. old teachers. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. that's the book. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I said we'd talk about it mm -hmm. late, uh, yeah. previously, and I want to talk mm -hmm. about it now because mm -hmm. it's very important for what we're doing, the perfect gentleman. Yes, and I think it's very important society. One of the things mm -hmm. that we started with perfect gentleman was because we felt that the skills that mm -hmm. you know I was taught at prep school mm -hmm. are, are sadly lacking no. uh, and not being taught. No. And part of my theory about mm -hmm. it is exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of schoolmasters. Yes. And now yes. everyone's a teacher. Yes. Yes. And yep. I find that fascinating. Yep. Why has that happened? Why, mm. why mm. are we neglecting the kind of, as you said, you actually said it, um, you know, 
we're preparing them for the future. Yeah. You know, yeah. I find it fascinating that yes. that's gone out of the way. When it makes yeah. a news item, yes. a news item on the BBC that they're teaching boys etiquette and manners. Yes. You just think, oh my God. Yes, absolutely. Gosh, that's a very, very difficult question. And I'm, uh, I, I think one thing that has changed enormously is that there are very, very few male role models in primary schools certainly in the maintained sector, and also, I would guess, fewer in the independent sector, in, in, in prep schools as well, than was the case when you were at Arnold House. Interestingly, I would say that at Arnold House, I would say it was about half and half mm. men and women on the staff. I wonder what it is today, as mm. a matter of interest. Um, why this has happened, I don't know, but it's very, very important for boys to have those role models. Um, I, I've, I agree with almost everything on the subject that, that, that Michael Gove is trying to do as Secretary of State for Education and, and, and I think he's ma making and has made a mark where a lot of his predecessors of both parties ha ha have not done. But where I disagree with him over something, and I think this is relevant, is that you know I see what he's trying to do in raising the academic profile of the teaching. You, you wouldn't have thought you needed to do it, but I think he's right, that the academic profile of, the te of, of teachers needs to be improved. But I don't think, actually, by precluding anyone who's got um, a third-class degree, say, that that's necessarily the right way of going about it. The best teacher I had at my prep school at Heatherdown, didn't have a degree, didn't go to university, didn't have a teaching qualification, yeah. but he was a marvellous teacher of French. Um, so I don't know what, um, I, I think there is more emphasis, clearly in, the, in these days of league tables, there is an undue um, uh, emphasis on results, 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 and of course they're important. But it's how you achieve the best results, which I think you, you get into. It's, it's not quite so straightforward. Um, I, I, I'm a great believer. I used to tell the parents at Papplewick, who were, you know, boy was sitting in scholarship to eat and say, oh, he, he mustn't be in the play, or he, 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 mustn't, uh, he mustn't play rugby. <coughs> it was an absolute nonsense. You know, the more a boy can do, the better his academic results can be, and he'll certainly be a more rounded person as a result. Now, I think that uh, isn't as... In this, I would say, my views are probably pretty old school, but I'm very, very pleased that someone of your generation <laughs> shares them, because that does give one hope. Yeah, I think it's very true. I, I mean, I, I wasn't a particularly academic child, nor particularly um, sporting child. Mm. But I enjoyed mm. doing it all, mm. you know, I, I think that, and, and because yeah. of that, that sort of formed the character that I am. And I find that, you know, as exactly as you say, I find mm. that we're, we're, we're driving our, our, our young people today to specialise early, yes. to focus on getting their A yes. stars, and, yes. yeah, which, is, as you said, is fantastic. But yeah. it neglects so yes. much else yeah. about character, yeah. you know, yeah. as we say, you know, you know, why are we doing, why is the perfect gentleman in existence? Well, because oh. it's fallen off the to-do lists of parents. It's fallen off the yeah. school curriculums. It's, and, and as my very good friend Harry says, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, you, you, you don't go to the army now, so you don't even learn it there. You no. know, no. you don't have those kind no. of, those are the skill sets that are required. No. No. And, you know, I've, I've read a number of articles recently mm. in the press saying that employers go, mm. great, wonderful results, but, yeah. Etiquette and manners yeah. and you know all round yeah. ability is actually what we yeah. want. Absolutely. It's very interesting. I mean I I've I haven't any children of my own, but I've got two stepsons and the younger one uh, went to Harrow. And he was very very sportive um, and, uh, and 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 quite naughty. Um, fortunately he had a very good strict housemaster. <laughs> uh, who kept him on the straight and narrow. The football referee, David Ellery, you know, if you, if you send Roy Keane off four times, you, you know, yes. you, you, he'll run a tidy ship. And, but, but his favourite 
Beeks, always favourite teachers at Harrow. Uh, uh, and this is surprising among a sort of bolshy, uh, grunting uh, 15, 16 year old, were what you would, you and I would probably recognise as old school gents, you know, the, the, the legends at Harrow, people like Dale Vargas and uh, Ross Beckett, you know, the old school, old fashioned schoolmasters, and, and someone like Staff, you know, you wouldn't think that, you'd think they would automatically. Uh, veer towards you know the, the younger sporty guys, but actually, they love what they regarded as old school old school manners, uh, and so that's encouraging. Um, but uh, but I think you're right. And we I need we need more schoolmasters and less teachers. I agree. That's great. I I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 that makes me happy. Um, uh, you're a cricket fan. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, one of the themes that's come up, uh, one cricket is one of them. Yeah. Um, and you, you said you're a very, you're quite a dab hand. I remember yeah. you're a dab hand at the at, at the bat. Mm -hmm. um, cricket's changed as well. Yes. And sports changed yeah. in that way. Mm. And and you talk about role models. Mm. <laughs> is that sort of upbringing as well coming through now, or do you think that you know we need to sort of slap our sporting heroes a bit harder and say, you need to behave. I think we do. Um, we, had this in, we had this interesting, um, uh, very controversial moment in the test series this summer of a former public school boy, Stuart Broad, Oakham. You know, clearly not just getting a fine edge through to the wicketkeeper, but an absolute thick outside edge, brushed the wicketkeeper's pad and was caught at slip. And he didn't walk. Um, now nah, there was endless, and, and actually, as a cricket, as an ardent supporter, I should say, of the England and Wales cricket board, being a Welshman, um, I, I, I get the argument, but it, but it's it's sad in a way that, you know, look, at, we're playing Australia. <laughs> Do they walk when they nick the ball through to the keeper, or even get a thick nick through to first slip? Do they walk? No. Um, so then, but but I would like to think that uh, good sportsmanship um, should prevail, and that the umpires have a very very difficult job. And I would like to see cricketers make their job a little easier. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think I think we we we've talked about it a number of times on our podcast and mm. and, and and internally amongst the team is that we we think you know. Our sporting heroes need, especially football mm. and cricket and rugby, where mm. you know they are forefront. Mm. You know they need to stand up and sort of be, be the idols that people yes. aspire to. Yes. And, and and as you said, w yeah. the winning at all cost mentality yeah. has sort of dampened sportsmanship. It has. And I, I'm 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 not yeah. a, a mad football uh, fan, but mm. I, I get frustrated. Yes. When I watch football yes. and you watch the, the behaviour of the players against the referee, and yes. you think, oh, yes. oh God. Yeah. Very interesting on that point, actually. When I was headmaster of Papal, we were very traditional as far as sport was concerned. We had a term of cricket and two terms of rugby. <laughs> and we didn't play this shiny shorts game at all. And, but of course, uh, more and more of the public schools were playing the Eton, uh, Charterhouse, you know, Bradfield, they're all great you know, footballing schools. So I thought, well, yes, um, we'll introduce uh, football during the short Lent term. <laughs> uh, we'll continue to play sevens, rugby sevens uh, as well, but we'll introduce uh, and actually play, you know, the boys used to play football a lot, but, only, but not matches against, with other schools. And it was interesting, the first game of football we played, suddenly, the boys started arguing with the ref, um, uh, or, you know, appealing for a throw and all that sort of stuff, which they'd seen their heroes at the Premier League do. Um, and that absolutely important. They wouldn't, they wouldn't dream of arguing with a rugby ref. No. Yeah? I mean, not least because there'd be another 10 yards, exactly. back you go. Um, and, and that was very interesting, and I think football and footballers are particularly culpable. Mm. Mm. I think it, it, it changes in order. Yeah. It's a great game. I love watching it. I was at Stamford Bridge last night. 
um, uh, but but I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I, I always say it would take one one FIFA directive, which would never happen, yeah. saying that, that if you if you dissent the ref, it's a red card. Yes. You'd lose half the team for two matches, yes. and everyone would behave again. Yes. yes. And it, it would it wouldn't take much. It would no. one bad weekend of football, no. and then everyone would suddenly no. realise that actually there's. You need to behave again. I think it's. I think that some of the sporting authorities in football, you see it in the ICC in cricket, where one country is allowed to call the shots. India. Um, they, they're not going to have um, DRS, um, the, the you know, review system. They're not going to have it. Everybody else has it. Surely they should just be told that they all do it. This is. This, this is. This is. We are the ICC, the World Cricketing Authority. And it's going to happen. But no. But no. <laughs> so your red card, I'm afraid, is not going to No, I, I don't think no. it's going to happen at all. I, I wish, yeah. I hope. But, uh, <laughs> but there we go. I, I hope for, I hope for the, uh, the, the future sporting mm -hmm. youth that they embody a bit more gentleman yeah. and sportsmanship yeah. In, yeah. In, their, in their thing. Um, mm. One of the things I'm fascinated about, because mm. I know mm. we're running mm. towards the end of our conversation mm. now, um, you now do a lot of bringing uh, foreign individuals into the UK yes, public yes. school system. Yes. How is that, and what you know? Do they want the English education? Is it because it's better, or is it because they want that English Britishness to rub off on on their children? What, what what's kind of the reasons for it? I think um, everything that has become rather out of fashion here is still very strong with. Um, those who want to send their children to independent schools. I think they want outstanding academic results, of course they do, but there is an element of wanting this, you know, this is where the address book, the international address book begins. Um, and I think that they certainly, I deal a lot with, um, with, with, with Russians, in particular, other nationalities too, and they have a very, very high opinion, rightly in my view, of the more holistic approach of the independent schools. Um, and um, it, it, it's actually, it's, it's, it's quite reassuring. Mm. Um, so much so that, I mean, let's give you a small and rather superficial uh, anecdotal evidence for this. I went to see a Russian client in, in, in Monaco once, and his 10-year-old daughter um, was at the international school there before going on to one of our schools uh, over here. And uh, he, the father said, uh, now, uh, Denise, will you please show Mr. Llewellyn your Collins Pictorial Dictionary? And instinctively he knew. There, there was a, 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 a picture of a house and various names of the rooms within the house. And there was something about those names that he didn't think was quite right. Uh, the, the perhaps in English, it, it, and actually his very words to me were, now, Mr. Llewellyn, tell Denise what the English upper classes call these rooms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that to me, I mean, I, nobody under the age of 40, I don't think, uh, over here anymore, gives a damn whether you... I don't know, use a, a, a popular example, the, use the toilet or, or the loo or whatever, you know, various sort of the words that uh, yes. Nancy Mitford made famous of being new and non-new. I don't think many people uh, of a certain, uh, be, 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 as I say, beyond the age, below the age of 40 give a damn about these things, but they matter to, the, it's funny, it's, it's, it's almost a throwback, and I think they're looking for, they, of course they're looking for great results, very often they're looking for Ivy League universities, so it's not just a British thing, but I think as far as the uh, independent schools are concerned, they love the idea of, you, of doing in the same, that you're in the classroom one minute, you're on the cricket field the next, you're um, on, on the stage, you're in the choir, you know, all those things which um, they see as, make, uh, as making a rounded individual. And uh, that, that's encouraging. Yeah, I hope they, they, they take it forward. So mm. Because this is what we find interesting, is, that is, is it within the UK, yeah. the perfect gentleman, what we're trying to yes. do, we, strugg we struggle to a certain degree because they, most men think they are, which um, 
unfortunately mm. is not true. Mm. Uh, but outside the UK, the idea of the British gentleman yeah. is still held in such a high yes. regard. Yes. And, so, as, and yeah. so we certainly need more schoolmasters in those independent schools. Yeah. Um, so that they can keep the holistic approach yeah. going. Yeah. Well, I ho hope that, that, mm. that you can keep that going a bit uh, radiant. Um, oh. uh, we've come to the uh, sort of end of our conversation now, so we're going to go and do our, our famous 10 questions. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So we end our gentleman talks, as we always do, with our now famous 10 questions. Uh, so, Ridian, what makes or embodies a gentleman for you? I think someone who appears in the paper three times in his lifetime. Once when he's born, second when he gets married, and third when he dies. <laughs> Very good. What is the most romantic thing you've ever done? Now this, this gave me a, quite a few problems here. Um, I, I think probably taking my wife on a um, surprise holiday. Um, but but uh, women don't really like surprises, I don't think, very much. And, and she spent, mess, it was only it was really modest to, to deafen, but she didn't know where we were going. And of course didn't know what to pack. Um, so I don't think it was a great success, but I think that's Probably it's not desperately romantic, but a surprise holiday is, is bad. That's, that's pretty good. That's uh, pretty good. You, you have to lace the lay the <laughs> groundwork on the surprises. Um, if you could bring one gentlemanly trait into business, what would it be? Oh well, I whether there were mythological days like this, but I think a handshake should be enough. And think of one would save on the lawyer's bills and the HR <laughs> department and. You know, most of my clients, I must say, a handshake is still enough, and I think that's terribly good. Recently, however, we've sold a, a house and a farm in Wales, and a handshake was not enough, and um, we were gazundered on both transactions. So I, I, I feel quite strongly that if you shake hands on a deal, a price, whatever it should be, uh, you should not renege on that. I feel right. that very strongly. Totally agree with that. Mm. What element of grooming is most important for you? <laughs> um, the, uh, yes, I think it's, um, it's, it's partly a family reason. It's my Uncle Reese's hairbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, he left them to me when he died in 1978. And they are wonderful sort of old-fashioned pair of hairbrushes. Um, ebony with uh, ivory initials LL oh. for Llewellyn on each. And I think that, that they would have to be those. For Wonderful. I'm fortunate I've still got some hair to brush. They're still very, very <laughs> astute, as they say. Um, name an iconic gentleman for us. Ah, uh, um, well, um, I suppose I would I would say my father, but, but um, iconic, I don't, in my eyes, but, but, but not in the wider world. Although he did say, actually, that the great advantage of being born a gentleman is one never need behave like one. <laughs> <laughs> but but okay. he, he certainly didn't li live his life uh, like that. I would say um, I don't know, David Niven, who was also with Heather Down, I mean, not at the same time as me, obviously. But, um, uh, and more recently, uh, cricket being a great lover, I would say Christopher Martin Jenkins, CMJ, uh, as, a, as, a, as a gentleman, as somebody who, absolutely professional behind the microphone, pretty chaotic, uh, 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 away from it, but exactly, you know, that def definition of a man, to be without pretense or sham, exactly what men think I am, yes. CMJ. Absolutely. Well, and then David Niven's mm. been on my is mm. my one of my most iconic. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, what's the most important item in your wardrobe? <laughs> um, I would say cufflinks. I, I like shirts with cuffs. I like your. Thank you very much. My, uh, the, and I've got lots of pairs. I one that belonged to my father. This actually belonged to my uncle, who was in the Twelfth Lancers. Uh -huh. uh, and um, I've got lots of pairs of cufflinks, and I like. I like cufflinks. 
I like cufflinks. I like, uh, think cuffed shirts are uh, yes. fantastic. Yes. I, I would, yep. If I wear shirts, they have to be cuffed. I, I'm very... Absolutely. Uh, unless on holiday. Yeah. Then, <laughs> oh, yes. then, 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 then the linen shirts come out. Yeah. Cuffed shirts. Whatever. Why should there be more gentlemen in the world? Well, I, th I think it would be a, I think it would be a, a, a happier world and a more civilised world um, if there were. Um, I remember being on holiday in South Africa. We go to South Africa most winters and walking on the cliff path in Hermanus. And everybody you came across um, uh, said good morning, good afternoon. And it was just such a change from walking up and down the Fulham Road uh, that, that when I got back, I said to my wife, now I'm going to start a trend. I'm going to say good morning to everybody whom I see up and down the Fulham Road. Well, of course, it was a disaster. And in fact, it was my, that same Horovian stepson who said to really, really, if you're not careful, you're going to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I would, that, that's what I would say. We'd be a happier, more civilised um, world, uh, one which people recognised each other. And, and, and really, it's, it's just an expression of putting others before self, which, of course, is a characteristic, I would hope, of a gentleman. Oh, so true. Uh, absolutely true. Um, this is very important for you. Question for you. What key skills should every young gentleman be taught? Um, to write thank you letters. You know, an email isn't the same. You know, you, you've got to take a bit of trouble. You've got to get a pen out and a piece of paper and you put it in an envelope and write an address and stick a stamp and remember to post it. it again, it's, it's you, you've made the effort. Yes. And I think that's, um, I think that's the most important thing. Definitely. Mm. What should a gentleman never be without? <laughs> um, a gentleman should never be without a smile. Very good. I would say. And mm. finally, the last question, finish mm. this sentence for us. A gentleman should always have all the qualities of a saint except saintliness. Not really? my words, <laughs> but <laughs> lovely nonetheless. Uh, yes, I hope that point comes across. I think that very much yeah. this. Ridian, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, and seeing you. And you. Lovely to see and you. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.